Well, good morning to you all. How'd you like to worship today? Worship was beautiful, wasn't it? How about the words that were given today? How did you like the words that were given today? They're powerful. And they're beautiful. And the spirit is so sweet and I'm so happy about it because today we're going to talk a little politics. And I'm going to make half of you mad. And it's okay. It's okay. I still love you and uh, I'm not perfect, but we have to talk about some things. In Acts 5.42 it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Right now, in the day that we live, and you hear me talk about this a lot, we, the staff, talk about this a lot. In the day that we live today, it is a crazy day. Amen. It is a day filled with lunacy. It is a day filled with nonsense. It is a day where there's division. And by the way, I got chastised for saying I'm going to end up creating division by the things we're saying. Let me tell you, God is a God of division. He separates sheep from goats. That's a big division. He separates the soul from the spirit. For what purpose? To make a person right before him. So division happens. And there is going to be division. And it's okay if you're on the right side of the divide. But if you're on the wrong side of the divide, woe to you. This is the warning before the warning. How do you treat your house? How do you treat your home? How do you treat your home life? Do you speak about Jesus in your home? Do you share it with your spouse? Do you share it with your children or grandchildren when you get the opportunity? We cannot afford to not share about the things of God to our children and our grandchildren, to our posterity. We can't miss it today. Actually, we could never miss it. It was always a big deal. How about you children who have parents and siblings? Do you share the gospel? Do you share the truth of who God is in your family? Older children, do you talk to your parents who might be lost about who Jesus is because of what you learned in youth group? Are you sharing what you've learned? College students, you all have something to say. You're just saying the wrong things these days. Now say the right things. Tell the truth of who Christ is in your family and be bold for him. Don't be bold for the nonsense. That's just going with the flow. That's, there's no boldness to that. That's just getting swept away by a torrent. Speak the truth in your family. Be the missionary in your own family. I know these are hard, hard, hard words. These are glorious, beautiful words about what God asks of us. Anyway, that was just for free. I wasn't going to talk about any of that. <laughs> Biblical perspectives versus the world's. A lot of what I'm going to share with you I got from Pastor Gary Hamrick. By the way, I got it from him because I went to his site and I heard him preach this message. And I said, there's so much here that I have to share what it was said because it was so well framed and so well put out there that um, I have to share it. So I just, if there's anything that's really good, it came from him. If there's something a little bit crazy, well, maybe it was me. I don't know. Thank you, Jesus. Forever in the church, we've heard about the separation of church and state. I've heard it from the beginning. And I remember about four years ago, the last election cycle, that when I began, that's when I kind of broke through out of my own fear and out of my own stinking thinking. And I made a decision that that stops. There's no more being afraid. It's, it's now we're stepping out in to speak the truth because it's so desperately needed and it is so desperately vacant in so many places that we have to speak about it. And I know that there's risks because for years I've heard other pastors say, oh, you can't talk about it political things you can't there's just some things you can't talk about because consequences will come and I, I was aware of those consequences the phrase separation of church and state is not found in any of our country's founding documents did you know that it's not in the Declaration of Independence it's not in the Constitution or it's not in the Bill of Rights 
There is no law on the books that says that we cannot speak the truth of who God is. Somewhere along, I know when it was, along the way, there was a deception that took place that made us feel and think that we cannot share about public things. Now, when we step into faith, there are consequences to stepping into faith. When I step out and I'm going to speak a truth that's going to cause a stir, that's a consequence. If I step out and I speak something that's hard and people are offended, that's a consequence that comes back at me. If I step out and say something about the political situation of the day, there's a consequence. And here's one of the potential consequences. You all know what it is. In 1802, Thomas Jefferson explained that the First Amendment provided a wall of separation between the church and the state. That wall isn't what we think it is today. That wall of separation is protecting the church from the state. All right? So once we know that, that's a game changer. I can say some things that I haven't said in a long time and that I only say to my friends, and I get to say them here today. Thank you, Jesus. What is it protecting us from? The state intruding in our rights to worship as we worship. That's what the law is about. That's what the talking and the discussion is about in that day. This was written to keep government out of the business of the church, not the church business out of the government. In fact, God expects the opposite. He expects us to stick our nose in the government and be a part of it and affect change in the government. Is, Is Marge here? Marge, wave your hand. She's here. Marge, 10 years ago, you told me we need to get people on the school board and we need to get people running for office and you were speaking this to me and you were getting angry at me and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's an old lady. She's not gonna, I went through the whole thing. Marge, I am sorry. You were right. You were more right than I ever knew that we are to get involved in the public arena to affect change to be a voice, to take your lumps and licks because that's what's going to happen when you step out into the arena. Do you ever see it? Do you ever see the stuff on TV with government? That is the most awful, vicious group of people I've ever seen in my life. They're bitter, angry people. And now we're going to send you in as sheep among wolves and tell you to go out in there and affect change and go to a school board meeting and say, I don't like this. I don't like any of this. What are you doing to our children? What nonsense are you teaching them? That's ridiculous. The children know it's ridiculous. Why are you peddling that? I'm going to vote different in the, at the next election for school board members. I'm going to rally different people. I'm going to say of the evil things I've heard in this office. They're not going to hug you. <laughs> They're not going to love you. That's the consequence for when we step out. What about here in the church? I have an audience with about probably 75% of you are liking what I'm saying. 25% of you are saying, why did they invite me to this church? (laughs) It's okay. Actually, if you disagree with me, we still love you here. I hope you come back. Um, But we're going to tell you the truth because it is a desperate day in which we live. And if we don't tell the truth, we're held accountable. I'm held accountable. I'll share that in a second here if I got done yelling at everybody. (laughs) Consequence here is we could lose our tax-exempt status. All right, I love the tax-exempt status. I love that every bit of giving I do, I can write off on my taxes and I get some of my money back. I like that. That's a good deal. I like it that when people give to the church, it helps us do the ministry that the church is supposed to do. I like that. The threat of losing that cannot trump, once again, no pun intended, cannot trump the reality of what the church is called to do or what I'm called to do. The nice benefit might be gone. That's a consequence of stepping out and we have to step out in faith and say the things that need to be said in this day. Why would I do that? Because I love my grandchildren. I love my children. I love my sister and brother-in-law who have children and grandchildren. I love the children in this church. They cost me a bundle in, whoop, not in those. They cost me a bundle in handing out these little pieces of candy. 
just so one day I'll have an opportunity to speak truth and he, they'll say, that's the nice guy that treats us good. I want to hear the truth that he has to say. It's just a simple thing. And we do it here in front of the whole world. Amen. There's a consequence to stepping out in faith. I see there's a lot of new faces here today. Somebody invited you here, I think. Praise God for the person that invited you here. Amen. We have people that have come here from the roughest of places and they're here a short period of time and you know what I'm seeing? The people that came here from the roughest of places are the people going out, bringing people out from out there and here and they're the ones leading the way to helping them get well, get on their feet. It's such a model of what's supposed to happen in the church. And I won't say some things because I'm afraid to lose my tax-exempt status. From now on, that's not for me to worry about. John, Craig, Mike, that's for you guys to worry about. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. The elders can worry about that. And by the way, they're loving what they're hearing right now. John was in the back teaching. John, that was, I wish I could have stayed for the whole thing. That was a great teaching. You know what he talked on? AI, transgender. Sally, do you have any more of those? Transhumanism. Transhumanism. Was there another one in there? Cloning. Cloning. What we're doing over the next, I don't know how many weeks, we're going to cover 70 issues that are political issues of the day because the liar out there said they're political issues, they're issues of the day, but truly they're issues that are written about in Scripture, and we're going to have pastors, elders, and other teachers and staff doing teachings in the pre-service bonus hour. For what purpose? That we're aware of what's happening in the world so we can speak truth to it. We can speak truth against it so we can speak the lies that are coming from it so that we can bring that truth to the church and hopefully extend it beyond that. Is that okay? Amen. Go to it. It's, it's uplifting. Uh, this message has some of what you were talking about. We didn't even get together and corroborate or collaborate on any of it. Well, I was going to tell you something else. What was I going to tell you? Oh, 1954. I'm going to give you a two-second history lesson. Lyndon B. Johnson proposed an amendment to the Constitution that 501c3 organizations, that's what we are, have to be separated from church. That's where that came from. That didn't come from documents from our founding fathers. That came from a hateful Democrat that wanted to shut the church up. Sorry if I offended you Democrats, but brace up, you're going to hear a little bit more. For those that sit in the seat, that sit on your duff, that don't get out and vote and don't play a part of the political process by doing the most simplest of tasks, I want to challenge you to get off, get up, go out and vote. How many people have voted already? Oh my goodness. How, put your hands down. How many are, are going to vote? Okay. Don't you hate it if you're the one person that didn't raise their hand? I'm not going to even ask. You know where it's going. Voting is a biblical thing. It's, it's how we take control, how we play a part in our, in our government, which affects us in, in many ways. Christians should be encouraged to vote. And how do they vote? They vote their conscience. All right? They, bo- they vote biblical values. How do you vote biblical values? You know biblical things. You know the Bible. You know what the Word says. How do you come to know the Bible? Oh, this is an easy one. You guys ask easy questions. Read it. That's right. Read it. Get involved in a life group. You will systematically grow in your understanding of the Word of God, and you will learn that you know how to learn. A lot of people are intimidated by the Word of God. And then we watch them two days, they're shaking, and then by the third or fourth meeting, they're giving me doctoral thesis on what they discovered. It is amazing. Get involved in a life group. Get involved in a Bible reading plan. Meet with people and talk about Scripture. And it'll begin to come to you. If you've got issues that are bigger than you feel, they're bigger than what you can handle, get involved in Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery helps you navigate the difficult things that most of us go through in life. And they do it from a Christian perspective. Scripture is wielded around in Celebrate Recovery all the time. But you get involved in the things of the church and you're going to see that if you're somebody that struggles with a disability, 
Your needs are going to be met on Friday nights. The Word of God is preached on Friday nights. And by the way, the Word of God is sometimes preached at a deeper level than what you're hearing from me rant on right now. Celebrate recovery. The Word of God is presented. Do you know that we have little children all over this church that are in the back, teenagers in the back? I don't know if the teenagers are in the back today, but they're getting taught the Word of God every Wednesday. And hopefully every Sunday. The Word of God is going out. You have to know the Word of God. You can't stand for anything. You can't defend anything if you don't know God's Word. We have to know His Word. I'm missing somebody, Sally. Who am I missing? Did I get them all? Okay, I'll come back. I don't think I got them all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For to us to make scripturally informed choices of whom to vote for and to know which policies uh, to support is not being a political thing. It's being a biblical thing. And right now, when people make the phrase that that's political, we shouldn't be talking about that, that's a lie. 70 things that we talk about are the very political things happening in the world and we talk about them here because the scripture spoke about them first. How do I know? I read the book and I've read it over and over and over again. In bite-sized chunks, I've read the book. To what end? That I would know what God is saying to us concerning multiple things. The problem is that our culture has taken a moral and biblical truth and made them political issues. Then they try to tell believers like us and pastors and teachers and elders and deacons and Christians to stop being political. I believe this is an epidemic in the church and I'm talking the greater church. There are really great pastors out there, man. I've met a lot of them and they will not tell you what I'm telling you right now because of the fear of the things that we talked about earlier. They're afraid of losing something. Uh, a, A big fear for most pastors is that seats empty out when you start talking hard truth. Why do they empty out? Because the the word of God is a stumbling block, the Bible says, to the unbeliever. What does that mean? That means when we speak the truth of God's word, which is the very thing they need to hear for their salvation, for their sustenance, for all their well-being, they're going to believe the lie. They believe the lie because it's offensive. Why is it offensive? Because they have not made a commitment to Christ. Because when you make your commitment to Christ, it changes And the word of God becomes life and sustaining and you see it more and more as you get into it. I want everybody in here to go into a life group, be a part of a life group. That's what I want to see. I want to see those who have skills to get going and start teaching the little kids. My best learning came, and you've heard me say this. Maybe this group hasn't, but you've heard me say this time and again. I learned my faith by listening to my wife teach my children the little stuff they had in the paper lunch bag about who Jesus is. I knew who Jesus was, but not like that. Not like that. Get involved and you will grow a lot quicker than the kids will if you get involved helping the kids. Let Amy worry about whether you get it or not. She'll she'll get you on board. Help with the youth group. Youth group is talking about almost the same issues that we talk about in the back with the adult uh, bonus hour and what we talk about here. Youth group is dealing with it. They could use help back there. Gerald, just stand up and wave your hand. Jared's our youth guy. Go talk to him how you want to be involved with helping with youth. Or can I send my kids there? Can I send my grandkids there? Can I send the neighbor that keeps picking apples from my tree there? Can I, you know, yes, yes, yes. He'd love it. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Lord. Here are some of the things that Scripture talks about that are issues that are foremost in the foreground of our world today. Life, marriage, parental authority, biological sex or gender, national borders, immigration, economic prosperity, Israel, the environment. These things are in Scripture, and these are topics and issues of this day that are at the forefront of this day. And the separation reveals itself when you see the nonsense and the lunacy of one side because you saw the truth of the word, and you see the realities and the benefits and the truth And the purpose is on the other side because the word of God reveals it to you. When you begin to look for God, we heard this earlier from Michael, he's looking back. You begin to look to him, he's ready to harvest you. 
when I say harvest, he's ready to bring you into the kingdom. And all of a sudden, everything begins to open up. You see truth, whereas before you didn't see truth, we saw dimly. That's how we see is dimly. But when we come to truth, more and more is revealed to us. We're in a dangerous day. And I'm going to take a liberty here. Obviously, there's one shofar lover in the church. I've been tooting this thing all day, and I haven't gotten three good coherent sounds out of it. I know I got about a puddle of spit right about here. Ooh. We ain't done yet. The staff got me this as a 10-year anniversary gift. Sally saw me blow on it, saw stuff spray out of it. She says, I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> but the people that gave it to me want to hear that thing blown. What is that thing? That's a shofar. And in the case that we're blowing it today is this is a warning. Blow. I gave you one warning that I was going to blow it, but really, the warning... <laughs> is for what to prepare for. Ezekiel 33, 1 says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory, and make him or her, no, not her, make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet or the shofar and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet, the shofar, and does not take the warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. In other words, when the warning is given and we don't receive the warning, the blood is on us for not receiving the warning that was given. All right, that's not all. If the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. Then it says, but he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, I just blew it. If he doesn't blow the trumpet, if he doesn't give the warning, or if he does not speak the word of God, who's responsible? the watchman or the one preaching or speaking. Jesus, thank you for that. The people are not warned. The sword comes and takes any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hands. If I don't tell you the truth, this is why it's getting easier and easier to tell the truth because I know what the consequences are on me if I don't tell the truth. My desire and my hope is to get better at it. My prayer for myself is that I don't fear telling the truth. I know when I say certain things, I know it's stirring people to the point where you want to get up and run out. I understand that. I can't worry about that. I used to worry about that. Not anymore. We speak the truth, we speak it in love, but we speak it because it's necessary for you to hear it because it is life. The word of truth, the word of God is life. God forgive anybody who steps on this pulpit and does not share that truth. And God, by your spirit, move through the hearts of every person in this place that they can receive the truth. That their hearts would be busted and broken for you. That the heart of stone would be crushed and become a heart of flesh. That the, the understandings of these hard truths become life to the hearer and they say I want that I want more of that there's a warning in this day and if you have eyes to see and you have ears to hear and you have a spirit to, to discern because the word of God is dwelling in you because you put it in you and the spirit of God is full in you 
unto works. And, it's, and you have the fullness of all of that going on in you. You have the ability to discern truth. And you want to embrace it. You embrace it. And you embrace it for a purpose because you're going to give it. You're going to give it. I, it's easy to say, go out and tell your family about Jesus. It's not easy for them to do, for you all to do, but that's the call, right? Go and tell. Go into all the world and tell. Go across the street and tell. Go to the kitchen and tell your neighbor to go tell. But it won't be received unless the truth is given in such a fashion that they don't hold the offense against the truth because they haven't cut them off. Your job is to tell. Don't worry about whether they receive it or not. You just tell. God grants the harvest. He's the harvester. We're just out there throwing the seed. He's harvesting. And he is harvest. He knows how to harvest. He knows who's with him and he knows who's against him. That's what he knows. We just know what we're supposed to do and that's tell. And I'm looking at my brother right now and I see that he's called back to the streets. I know it. Because you tell people the truth of who Christ is. And I believe last Wednesday was the start of you getting back in that thing. So I pray God's hand upon you as you do that. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but Deb, I think God has still got his hand on you. Is she in here? I don't know. But God still has her, his hand on her for street ministry because that's what she does. So you heard the warning, and now do you respond to the warning? Are you aware and alert to the things that are happening in this world? Beyond the surface. But are you aware to the point where you're going to step out of yourself to affect change for the glory of God? That's the call for the church. Page two. We heard this scripture earlier. God has called the church to be this to the people. We're called to be salt, the salt of the earth. We're called to be light, light of the world. Those are the two things that God has put on us. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how can it be, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill. That is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Wow. Let it shine. Take the tomato in the face. But let your light shine because it's going to have an impact. And if you get to the place where you share the word with them, the Bible tells us that does not return empty or return void. You give them the word. And there may be some sacrifice when you do that. You may be ousted, discarded, canceled, whatever. That could all happen. It's okay. God doesn't cancel you. He's... He's not going to wash you away. He's not going to discard you. In fact, the tougher it is, the more he's going to grab onto you Amen. and sustain you and help you and hold you. Our God is amazing, and he gives us these things to do. So what does that mean for us in this day that we live? we got about 14 people left that have to vote. <laughs> How cool is that? Know that when you go into the ballot box, you're advocating for policies that promote righteousness. Jesus is the righteous one. There's no other righteousness than him. There's no righteousness in and of ourselves, on, by ourselves. The only righteousness we have is when we clothe ourselves in his righteousness. He is our righteousness. Voting for candidates who best represent your biblical values so you have to cultivate and know and have biblical values. You have to be in his word. That's what we said before. We pray for our elected leaders and holding them accountable. You can yell and, and, and get angry and get all fired up and gossip and all that stuff. But none of that stuff carries any weight. It has no impact. But praying for people especially praying for people that have opposing views that, that you don't like, pray for them, that God would break them. 
in a beautiful way. Thank you, Jesus. And then as Marge Milkey told me 10 years ago, listen to see if you're called to an office. Listen to see if you're called to a school board meeting. Go in there and have something to say. If nonsense is being spewed out, speak truth. If it's something that makes you angry inside, let them know you're angry with what's happening. Go to a school board meeting. We'll probably do another chili cook-off just for you if you go to a school board meeting and cause a stir in a good way. In Jesus' name, that'll get me in trouble. Thank you, Jesus. Here's the reality of the day. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 says, through 12, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless, non, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among all those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them, oh, this is, this is almost hard to say, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is one of the most sobering scriptures ever. That when you share the truth of God, he is at work. And you trust God to do what he does. He is the one who's righteous. We're just being obedient. But the consequences are grave for those who reject the truth of God. And when it says God will send them strong delusion, if you look at the lunacy of the day, take another step, a deeper look, and look at the people that have bought into the delusions and the nonsense of the day. They're deceived. Why? Because they've systematically rejected the truth of God and who he is. They've blasphemed him and have committed adultery with other gods. And consequence, the consequences of that are that they receive strong delusion. You speak the truth to them and let them wrestle with it and let God do what God does. Amen. All right? That's just a... a challenge to the church and right now in my spirit I'm feeling it's a challenge to the teenagers and this is a challenge to those who sit on the sidelines Dietrich Bonhoeffer said silence in the face of evil is evil and God will not hold us guiltless not to speak is to speak and not to act is to act to not receive Christ is denying him to not speak truth in a given circumstance or situation is acting in opposition to it. He's given us a mouth, he's given us lips, he's given us a heart, and he's given us a spirit by which to operate. Amen. If you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the power and the authority to walk in that for the purpose of sharing the truth of who Christ is. That's our aim, that's our goal, is to share who he is and give glory to him and let the outcomes be his business. Amen? Amen. Y'all about getting ready to eat some chili? <laughs> yeah, if you keep yakking, we'll never get there, I know. So what has God done? In Ephesians 4.11, And he himself has gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's a big part of this whole equation to build up and be a part of the body of Christ. We're going to take communion in a little while. It's a way that the church comes together. We're going to have an extended communion in the back. But that's what God has called us to do, to come together as believers, to be equipped. Equipped for what? For the ministry. What ministry? Whatever he's called you to do. Till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. I have a family that I love very much. And we argue and we fight. And right now there's disunity in the family. People have different ideas, different thoughts. The interesting thing is, we all know that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. 
if that happens in a family, that really you do love and care for each other, and we all know the truth. How much more difficult is it when you go to a family that doesn't know it, but how much more fresh it is when you go there and you actually speak truth like they've never heard before? Right? We find ourselves preaching at the church often. We we're supposed to for the building up and the edifying of the church. But it shouldn't come to the place where there's such divisions that we have divides. It should come to the place where we're united because we're in agreement on the truth. And we only can only do that is if we allow the Holy Spirit to move as we share the truth of God's word with each other in terms of blessing and encouraging and building up as opposed to winning arguments. When we love the people's, in, the people's new word, when we love the people's in our family and we love them truly, we can get past those little divisive things and we begin to demonstrate our faith in our love. Once we know that they've heard the truth, now you give them the love. Because we can give the truth in love, and that's what's effective, and that's what's powerful, and that's what's purposeful. So I pray for every person right now in Jesus' name. I pray for you and your families. I think of the grandparents in this room who are praying for grandchildren and children to get right before God. I pray that God would answer your prayer. I also pray that he would give you a way to speak life to them without being a nuisance to them. I pray that in Jesus' name. Praying this for myself. I pray for the siblings in this church who can't get along with their other siblings that by the Spirit of God, he would unite. He would unite where there is discord. I pray for that in Jesus' name. I pray for those who are walking around with unforgiveness that you would let it go and forgive. We had a message a while back. How many times? Seven times? No, 70 times? Seven times 70? 70 to the 70th power? Yeah. Always, perfectly, completely forgiving. Let the offenses go because salvation is bigger than all that stuff, right? Okay. I had a list of things here. I think you guys get it. Um, I don't know if I want to go through the list. I'm really thinking about the chili. (laughs) Know that God uses flawed people. He will restore judges and he deals with judges. He will restore border security and he's the one who dealt with border security. He will deal with Israel and Israel's going to go on a ride for a while. But in the end, those are his chosen people. They're special and we're called to pray for them. They're going to be okay. I told you a couple weeks ago, Israel wins in this whole deal. Those who come to Christ eternally win in this deal. Pray for Israel's salvation. God's going to bring about religious liberty. We might not see it in this day. God understands biological sex. He understands the desires in people's hearts. He knows the struggle that people have with it, and he knows the attacks that they've experienced in a school system that's indoctrinated them beyond what most of us even know. But he knows about it. He knows about family. He knows about family and discord. And he knows that, and we know that his heart is that the families would come together and be united in family. That's a big deal. Do you ever weep over the discord within a family? Did you ever hurt for a sibling, a parent, a child, a grandchild because of discord? He knows about it. And so we give it to him. The issues of life. God knows about life. He is life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is life. And he is God. He knows about life. Do you continue the fight for life? Of course you do. Of course we do. We keep the fight for life going. These are all issues that come up in an election. Particularly in this election. And there's a message in that. And the message is that we don't give up. We don't quit. We keep fighting because these are issues. These are biblical issues before they were political issues. And then he gives us a call. This is for all of us. In Romans 12, 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is 
that good and acceptable and perfect gift. I believe this is, I believe scripture lines up with it, but it's a lot of how I feel. I believe we are living in the last days. Christ said that these are the last days. Once he's gone, we're in the last days. But I believe we're coming to the end of the last days. And you've heard it before. When the world comes against Israel overnight, that's a tell, that's a sign. It's a big one. When you see the separation of sheep and goats, which is a spiritual picture of the reality of believers and non-believers, and you see the separation happening, we're coming to the end. And the separation is happening. For those that skirt on the fence, that will be done away with. I've said it, we've said it from the pulpit, many of us, time and time again. There's no more riding on the fence. This is a day to get our hands and our feet dirty and jump in the middle of the mess and speak life to people. Take your shots and your hits, and you're gonna. But you're gonna see the victories, and they will transcend all that. What was it like for Stephen? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Stephen holding to the firm foundation which he believed in Christ? And God took care of him. He brought him home. Amen. That's the kind of conviction we have to have within us in this day. If you're a professing Christian, the world doesn't accept you like it did 15 years ago. And then it wasn't very good. No, we're going to let our light shine. We're going to be salt. We're going to be light. We're going to speak truth. We're going to eat some chili. We're going to have communion. It's all good. The Lord is on the throne. Things already better. Things already better. When the Lord is on the throne, things already better. Things are Betty, Betty Retter. <laughs> Learned that song on a mission trip. Mambo sawa sawa. <laughs> Mambo sawa sawa. Hezu akiwa enzani. Mambo sawa sawa. Mambo sawa sawa. Wish I knew the last words. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gerald. We're going to take communion as a body of believers united in our faith, which is a big deal. That's why I call it communion. We're communing with one another. After communion, we're going to take bigger communion in the back with chili dogs and chili and marking Pastor Mike's chili as best over Mark Schuyler's. We want to have that stuff in order and in place. Here's what we ask if you want to take communion with us. What we ask is that you know who Jesus Christ is in terms of him being your Lord and your Savior. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, you are a child of God, you are welcome to take communion with us here. And we welcome that. If you're not a believer, and maybe you heard something today that stirred you, not in a mean, nasty way towards me, but it stirred you in a way where God got a hold of your heart, you can make a decision today to receive Jesus. And you can take communion with us today. Is there anybody here that wants to receive Jesus? You've never received him before? You never said, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, be my God? I see that hand, brother. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else who wants to receive Jesus, be a child of God? I see that hand, precious one. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Okay. Pat? Pat? There is a precious little child right over, sitting down right over here. Can you raise your hand again? Yeah, can you go over by her and just pray with her? Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray together and support these two that raised their hand to receive Christ. Dear Jesus, we know our need. Apart from you, we are lost. With you, we have everlasting life. I invite you to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my one true God. Forgive me of my sins. Remove them from me as far as the east is from the west. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
We're going to take communion. Uh, the team is going to do a song or two when, when we're done taking communion. If you don't have a communion element, one of these guys, we have some up at the front of the altar. Come on up and grab one. You can do that. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask you to pray, and I'm going to ask you to pray. Okay? You're going to pray over the blood. You're going to pray over the broken body. Aren't you glad you're up here today? <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 11.27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man or a woman examine themselves, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body. Thank you, Jesus. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Who's praying over the body? That's me. Okay, go ahead. Lord, thank you that you saw what was ahead of you and you didn't turn back that you didn't flinch away from giving yourself fully uh, to the service that you've rendered to all of us through salvation. Thank you for this broken body, and as we take it together, may our hearts and minds and spirits be made one with you and with each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's take of the body together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in as, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Katie? Dear Father, we thank you for the blood that you did shed and that it's something that we can remember again and again. May it never get old. May it never lose its luster that we would always give full love back to you for what you've done. That was an extreme amount that you did for on the cross. And I just, it's hard to remember to the full extent each time I take it. But Lord, ready my heart. Ready that I would remember personally what you've done each and every time to the full extent. Amen. Amen. Let us take the cup together. <clears throat> 